scriptures and biblical methods that we can use to reprogram our mind. And uh, to try to stop negative thoughts. Uh, how do we stop constantly rolling over in our head past wrongs, things that happened in the past? Uh, how do we learn to live in the present and deal with the things we have to deal with today? And then how do we take charge of our thoughts? All of those really uh, have one, one kind of an answer to it. Uh, but those are the ones we're going to try to attack. When we do that, we're going to recognize that our greatest difficulty uh, for any Christian is uh, controlling our thoughts. I don't think there's a greater battle that any Christian has uh, other than uh, trying to control their thoughts. After all, that's where the battle is, uh, is won or it's lost is 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 up here in our mind um, and we we sometimes go a little bit crazy trying to figure out what am I going to do what's going on and when we do that we we actually give over control of our thoughts and allow them just to run on their own okay now the question comes up is it possible is it really realistic and is it possible to uh, control our thoughts the answer to that is a resounding yes. If, if, we, if it were not possible, we would not be responsible for our thoughts. So we have to start from that perspective that if, if I can control my thoughts and my thoughts are array and I'm going to be held re responsible for that, then I better uh, change my thinking <laughs> about my thoughts. Um, sometimes we just think they, they run, you know, either God's doing something or the devil's doing something, but somebody's just pushing all this stuff in our mind and we don't have any control over it. Another foundational uh, principle that I think we need to, uh, to know is that there are some things uh, that influences that we can't control. You know, our thoughts are... Um, is kind of a, a culmination of our experiences, um, the things we see, the things we hear. Uh, it's a combination of all of that gets in, into our brain. We sometimes don't have control over those coming in. Okay, uh, you can't stop your eyes from hearing, from from seeing. You can't stop your your ears from hearing and as we're growing up sometimes the circumstances and situations that we get into are are imposed upon us that are, are very negative and they're impressed upon our mind but we did not actively engage and, and want that and they're there okay so I'm not I, I wanted to lay that foundation because the topic itself the question itself is um, I don't want to leave us with, with the thought that this is an easy thing to do at all. It is, the, it is really the pinnacle of everything else in our, in our Christian life is our mind. Repentance is a change of mind, okay, about the gospel of Jesus Christ. We, we went through that already, correct? So everything hinges on me changing my mind, me doing something uh, that causes my, my mind to change, my conduct and behavior to change. And we're going to find out that as, as a born-again believer, the Holy Spirit is the one that really is helping us do all of that. Okay? Um, we then have to be careful... of what we can control. So we can control some things that are coming into our mind and so we must not put some things in our mind because if we put the wrong stuff in there 
it will begin to control our thoughts. It will begin to shape our thoughts. And those thoughts will become, if it's, an, if it's something not good, our thoughts become negative. And sometimes an, an activity that is going on over here and my thoughts are focused on that in a negative manner, we don't even associate that with something that we put in our mind way back over here. We, we don't even think about it in those terms. But... Um, the scripture says, uh, don't give the devil a foothold. He may come in one way, but he wants to do something another way in order to disguise that he even came in in terms of our thoughts. He wants to disguise that so we may not recognize that the reason that I'm thinking this way really is I'm under an attack. This is an attack because I left the door open over here and these two activities aren't even related to each other. And yet it is impacting the way I think and the way I deal with other things. And so I have these negative thoughts. Amen. The first scripture I want us to, to go to uh, a talk about is uh, one we're all familiar with. And we all we're familiar with all of these is John 14, 26. John 14, 26. But the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance, whatsoever I have said unto you. Without God, I cannot and will never have a good thought. We've we got we to start there. Because if I'm going to renew my mind, I cannot do that in and of myself. And when I talk about the scripture talks about renewing the mind, or uh, uh, it, it is talking about uh, thinking differently than the world thinks. When we say renewing the mind. I cannot think any differently than the world unless the Spirit of God is within me and is teaching me, leading me into all truths, testifying to um, the person and the work of Jesus Christ. Okay, And so we have to be teachable, which means that I must be meditating on the Word day and night. Meditation is something we do where in the mind now the question is dealing with uh, to stop constantly thinking of of the past or negative things constantly thinking of that so I'll use the same term what I'm doing is I'm meditating on those things that are negative I'm actually giving myself to those things while I'm complaining about thinking negative right so as I meditate on the negative things I continue to have negative thoughts which frustrate me how do I fix that I must change what I meditate on I must change what I meditate on I must then meditate on the Word of God day and night I must delight in the things of the Lord okay in order for for my thinking not to be negative I'm already exercising my mind it, by meditating on the negative to renew that I don't want to stop meditating but I want to stop I want to change the focus of my meditation so I have opened up space if I'm if I'm thinking of things negative I'm giving place in my brain and I'm giving space, rental space, not charging anything for it. 
But I'm giving all that space in my mind to something negative and it's taking over my thought process. And so every situation then becomes negative because I've let that, I've, I've meditated on that and I just rolled it over to the point where it's, it's occupying a significant amount of my gray matter. I change that by meditating on that which is good. What is good? The word of God is good. The word of God is, tr is, is true. The word of God has been tried. If I cannot without God have good thoughts, the only way I'm going to get th good thoughts is to meditate on his word. It, it, is, it is essentially, what am I doing? I am disciplining my mind. I am disciplining my mind. As an old uh, track runner, uh, some 50 years ago, uh, <laughs> uh, you know, uh, when, you, when you first start out doing distance running, you don't just go out there and, and rip, you know, 5, 10, 15 miles. You just don't do that. Everything in your body is telling you, stop. Everything in your body is looking back to make sure nobody's looking while you look for a shortcut back. But over the months, as the training and the discipline kicks in. What is discipline? I'm doing something positive every day incrementally in order to achieve the final goal. And after a while, it, 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 it sounds crazy, but you know, you, you're clipping off 15 miles with no problem, 10 miles with no problem at all. Now, you may not be doing that at lightning speed, but it's not about the race. It's about the discipline that got you to that point. So when we talk about controlling our mind, we're talking about something that is difficult. And we must put forth a significant amount of our energy to achieve that goal. It will not happen only because we memorize or we put meditate on the word we must meditate for the purpose of exercising that word as we come to understand it. So I'm meditating on it to gain better understanding. And I'm also giving the Holy Spirit an arsenal so that when he is bringing to my remembrance, he has something to bring to my remembrance. If I do not meditate on the word, though he, he's trying to talk to me, I don't know what he's saying. Because I, ha I don't have the word. The, 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 the language of the Holy Spirit is the word of God. That's his language. We say the scriptures are inspired. Okay. Who inspired them? What breath breathes these words? The Holy Spirit. The very spirit of God. Their God breathe. Okay. So we need to have this uh, then... A, a teachable spirit. We also, un underneath this teachable spirit, need to recognize what Hebrews 4.12, just jot that down, uh, says at the end. He says, well, I'll read the whole thing. For the word of God is quick, it is powerful, it is sharper than a two-edged sword, piercing even the asunder, the dividing asunder of the soul and the spirit and of the joints in the matter. But it's this last part that's important to us if we're going to uh, change our, our thinking and is a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. We have to live with our, with our thoughts exposed to God. Remember this morning I said a lot of, uh, that we have talked about in terms of the gospel, if we, if we don't have evidence of that, if there's not something going on with all of that, it's all academic. So simply sitting and meditating on the word is good and, and memorize it is good, but we have to become accountable to God ourselves personally. And so 
if we know he is, is hearing and my thoughts, he knows what I'm thinking. If those thoughts are inconsistent with his word, that ought to bother me. And see, that's, that's somewhat of a motive, I guess you might say, to, hey, I got to get rid of that thought. And I got I to gotta rely on the Holy Spirit more and more. I got to pray, Lord, purify my mind. Help me, you know, do this thing. Okay? And, and I'm not saying we can do this by willpower. We cannot. But as we submit to the, to the will of God, now we're, we're taking in, and we're no longer taking in this thing over here, this negative stuff that we've given space in our brain to, and we're giving more space in our brain to or our mind to the Word of God. We're giving more space to that. So that at the time this negative thought comes, it's not going to go away. It is going to come again, but now I'm, I've got something to combat that with. And now I can, in my mind, I know God is watching. I know he's not watching to condemn me, but I'm submitted my mind to the Lord. And so right away I say, that's not a thought of God. And I reject it and I replace it with what the Holy Spirit gives me to replace it with. So it has to be a replacement type thing. The renewing of the mind is a replacement, not just, not just, although it is, it is necessary, but not just the memorization of Scripture. Okay? Not just the memorization. Memorization is, is good. Matter of fact, just reading the Bible itself, whether you're getting something out of it or not, is good. Because we may not think we're getting something out of it until something comes up and the Holy Spirit says, Hey, remember? <laughs> okay. Um, and that way, it, it, we, we're not reading and trying to compact something in our brain that will really start to discourage us. But I think as we read and understand that God is, that we've submitted our mind to God, we've surrendered our thoughts to God, and then we will be more um, likely or we'll be able to more quickly discharge any thought that is negative it will come in but it's what we do with it when it gets there that makes the difference so this is not about those thoughts are never going to be there it's about what do i do with them when they show up and over time as i meditate on the word meditate on the word i can't guarantee we're going to have less uh, negative thoughts, but I but the word will, will uh, guarantees us that we will no longer act on those thoughts. Those thoughts will never bring us down. We won't uh, allow the, those to be cultivated. Earlier, we talked about sometimes we get these evil these these uh, these negative thoughts, and we wrap it in swaddling clothes and give it a bottle and take it around with us. You know, and ten years later. We can't hold them in our arms anymore because it's grown. And now we've got what we call later on, we'll be looking at a stronghold. We've got this, it's no more an infant there that we can kind of control. Now we've got a grown man up in there who doesn't want to who, who leave. And so it, be, it becomes difficult. Doesn't mean he can't leave and he won't leave, but it'll take a little bit longer. So, so we, 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 we should not cultivate those things. And understanding that it is an ongoing process. The second scripture I would have us to look at is uh, 2 Corinthians 10, uh, um, 3. As we go through all of this, what is really interesting is what the Bible is telling us to do, and you'll see that in these scriptures. If you went to any reputable psychologist, worldly psychologist, he would tell you almost the same thing. He may not be quoting scripture, but he'd be telling you the same thing. 
You're down on yourself. Stop thinking that way. Amen. He'd be telling you something very similar to this. The difference is he'd be telling you to do it on your own and you can't. God's saying, I'm telling you to do it and you can because I'm the one that's doing it in you. See the difference? Uh, I told someone some years ago in a, in a counseling session, they were, they were going and, and, and seeing some uh, psychologist, or what, whoever they were. And I said, you know, I, I'm not against all of that if, if that's what you got to do. But all they can do is tell you how to cope with your problem. That's all they can do. They give you some coping mechanisms, but they don't solve your problems. God solves the problem. <laughs> That's the difference. Amen. So from now on, my fee is $400 an hour. <laughs> That's what they charge to, to lay on a couch that ain't even comfortable. <laughs> Are you at 2 Corinthians 10, verse 3? And again, I'm emphasizing that controlling our thoughts is a matter of discipline. For though we walk in the flesh... We do not war after the flesh. So we're in this world and negative things are going to happen to us. They cannot be avoided. Negative things, uh, even amongst Christians, negative things happen to us. That's just, we're humans. But they're going to happen. So Paul says right off the bat, hey, look here. I recognize that I'm, I'm in a world where negativity is always trying to impact me and cause me to act in a way that is inconsistent with who I am. And so he said he, 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 he's open to that. We need to be open to that. And I tell you, we call it now. Don't be so thin skinned. Well, what are we saying? Hey, come on, this is, this is life. Get over it. I mean, <laughs> this is the way people act. This is what people do. And so Paul is saying that, though I walk in the flesh, hey, I'm not some superhuman being. I'm not some superman. Uh, I have the same kind of pressures. I have the same things coming against me. But how I handle them, we do not war after the flesh. I handle them differently. I handle them differently. Amen. And that's what we're trying to do tonight is kind of give us some kind of a, a scriptures and maybe a method of attacking the, the negativities that come in our mind. So maybe we could do something different. Um, and the different is the things that we're going over over here. And they may be helpful to us. And as you go along, you may pick up some other areas that might uh, reinforce what we're talking about. And he gives a reason for that in verse 4. He says, for the weapons of our warf warfare are not carnal. I can't win this battle through the flesh. I can't renew my mind just because I say I want to renew my mind. I can't do that. So th they're not carnal, but they're mighty through God. God can do that work. And then it talks about pulling down strongholds. And I use the 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 illustration there of the baby uh, you know and that's when that thought initially comes into our mind that's the baby what we do with the baby at that time you know treat him like hagar <laughs> you know uh, throw throw hagar out and the baby out then we don't we don't have a problem but if we give the baby a bottle and let him hang around a couple of years you know, they're 30, 40 years old now. They, they don't leave so easily because they've made a home there and becomes difficult. And, and that becomes a stronghold. Why? Because we have held on to that thing. Now watch it. Some things we brought in with us, correct? Before we got saved, there were, there were these strongholds, if you will. And some of them came on us not of our own accord. That's why I wanted to preference that in the beginning. We didn't bring that situation on. Um, a bad family situation, bad relatives, bad this, bad that. A child cannot control his environment or her environment. 
and those creating us in the child, unbeknown to the child, uh, these strongholds, that then when we get saved, they, they're still kind of there. They're still kind of there, and they keep popping up, and they keep troubling us, and they keep giving us uh, problems sometimes. And then we've got a, a whole slew of ministries out there who want to redefine what a stronghold is and how to get rid of it and laying hands and doing all these things, but that's not going to get rid of that stronghold. That's going to do what the psychologists and psychiatrists attempt to do. The psychiatrist does it with, with, uh, with drugs, and the psychologist does it by trying to get you to cope with the situation um, to try to get rid of that stronghold. But it never goes away. God says, it, Paul says, it is mighty, mighty. These weapons that we're using, they're mighty because the source of my weaponry is God. It is not something that I came up with, but God is the weapon that I'm using against that stronghold. And to pulling down that stronghold. Cast it, and the strongholds are where? In, in the mind. Casting down imaginations. Imaginations deals with what? The mind. How many perceptions do we have? We, we get something that's the size of the head of a pin. And we blow it up. Because we have inputted all of these perceptions on top of that. And now it is huge. And it creates, because we've created it, a stronghold. Self-created stronghold. And so Paul says that, but with God, we can cast all of that down. Every high thing, that is, anything that raises up against the Word of God. So the Holy Spirit then is telling us what, how we ought to act. Correct? And this negative thought is coming in and contradicting what the Holy Spirit is telling us to do. Now we're right at the battle, aren't we? We've got two thoughts in our mind contending for control over what we do, and we don't have a lot of time to think about it. Somebody sneak up behind you and slap you. You ain't got a lot of time to think about that. <laughs> Amen. Ain't no telling what come out of our mouth or what we'll do. That's why we have to have this meditation. We have to, it, it has to be there beforehand. It has to be a practice that we've, we've practiced and practiced and practiced and practiced so much that hopefully if we get that slap, we're more apt not to respond negatively. And it, even if we do respond negatively, it's gone quickly. It's not retained. You see that? I mean, because we're not superhumans. So I'm not going to pretend that sometime if somebody snuck up behind us and slapped the daylights out of us that we may not act in the most biblical way. <laughs> Joy sitting there saying, now hold on, bro. Um, we might not act in the, in, in the most biblical way, but then the Holy Spirit grabs us and reminds us, see, you're a human being. Stop trying to be superhuman. You see that? Stop trying to be superhuman, okay? And then he tells us, here's the right thing you should have done. And so we learn from that. Isn't that, isn't that wonderful? So as these things come up, one of the ways I, I, I do that and is I just say, that's not a thought of God. And then I begin to battle against that thought. I don't, I don't harbor on the thought. I harbor on the Word of God. Okay? I, I'm not sitting here taking the thought, oh, why am I doing that? Why is that thought there? And I'm trying to push this thought. No, I grab a hold of the Word of God and let the Word of God minister to me, and then that thought goes away. It, I, I don't give it space. I don't give it time to settle up in here and germinate get roots, and start bearing fruit in my uh, conduct and behavior, if you will. And then it says that exalts itself against the knowledge of God 
and brings into captivity every thought to obedience. There's the discipline. You see that? That's the, I have to bring my thoughts into alignment with the word that the Holy Spirit is bringing to my remembrance. Because once he brings it, that's all he can do. Until I make the decision to act. And when I say, yeah, Holy Ghost, the power of heaven is released. Isn't that something? And so I am successful in overcoming those negative thoughts. I'm successful in that. If I fail in that, it may be five minutes, ten minutes it takes to catch up with me. But when it does catch up in, with me, I still correct it before that baby becomes a grown man. Because this is a process and we're going to fail a little bit in this process. We're going to come a little discouraged sometime in the process. Because we're not used to depending on the Holy Spirit to this extent. Okay? But let me tell you, if we get this down, wow. Man, I'm going to tell you, everything else will line up. Because we will see and experience the power of God working against this old flesh and giving us the victory that Christ has won already on the cross. Isn't that great? Um, next, let's look at Philippians 4 and 8. You know, we couldn't leave that one out. Some of you probably already had that in mind. If he don't say that, I'm going to say something. So far, I haven't said a single scripture that we don't know. Correct? Yeah. So we're helping us to apply those now. You remember this morning I said that the whole, one of the things the Holy Spirit does, not one, but the most important thing, is the Holy Ghost applies the finished work of Christ. He applies the cross to us. To us. That's what he does. That's where the power comes from to overcome. Because Christ has already overcome. What I'm doing is submitting to him. Where? On the cross. On the cross. And the cross did not defeat him, did it? Okay, so we can't let these things uh, 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 defeat us. I mean, we're in a battle. It's a real battle uh, for control of our mind. So instead of dwelling on these negative thoughts, counter them with good thoughts. Verse 8, uh, chapter 4. Are you there? Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true. Now let me go through these here real quick. Whatso whatsoever things are true. Sometimes we, <laughs> we exaggerate things. They're not true. I would gather that every one of us at some time in a close relationship with a spouse or, or a friend. And if you've had a falling out. One of the words that comes up is you always do that. We interject that word always. Now we've got to ask ourselves, is that true? Or have I exaggerated that to try to get a better position in the argument? Okay. Now, we're going to talk about this later. If I'd have forgiven, I couldn't say that anyhow. <laughs> right? I can't go back and say always because I, I, I forgave that so that's not there anymore. But is it true? Have we exaggerated the situation and blown it up so big that, that uh, um, you know, we're feeling pretty strong in the flesh now and boy, we're going to win this battle because after all, <laughs> you always do this. 
That's not true. We've got to ask ourselves, when that negative thought comes in there, is that true? Is it true? And if not, reject it. Now, sometimes it's a negative thought when the Holy Ghost comes in there and tell us to correct ourselves. <laughs> we may look at that as negative. I'm not talking about that as a negative thought. I'm talking about negative thoughts that really kind of wind us down and uh, cause, a, cause us to come in conflict with the Holy Spirit. And because we're in conflict with the Holy Spirit, that's why we're unhappy. That's why we're unhappy. And there's nothing that's going to be able to solve that. Also, we look at the word noble. Noble is saying, is this thought that I'm having worthy of me honoring that thought and allowing it to hang around in my mind? How is that thought going to edify me if I keep that thought? Hmm. These, this is a real process. Do I expect you to remember all of this? I don't expect you to remember all of it. That's why we have the Holy Spirit. That's why we have the Holy Spirit. Because if this is the Word of God, then we're getting that Word in us, and we just learn the Holy Spirit will bring back to our remembrance. So, so don't, 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 don't challenge your brain trying to get a, a kind of a formula out of this. I'm giving a general overview of some things that we need to begin with if we're going to take back control because the only reason we don't have control is not that somebody took control, we gave over control. We gave that control over. Not 100% because I've already said there's some things that, that we did not have control over that came in. And, and a lot of those are very difficult to, to, to deal with, but they can be dealt with. He talks about, is this thing just? Is it right? Is it right? Pure. Is it cultivating holiness in me? By allowing that thought to hang around? Is this thing making me more godly? Even as you go through this, you can see that negative thought just melting away because it's, it's kind of rhetorical in, in that the answer is no, 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 no. And, and as I'm putting the word in, guess what, where the negative thought is going? Out. See that? I hadn't looked at that negative thought and tried to push it out. I put the word in there and the word pushed it out. Big difference. Big difference. He says, look at those things that are lovely. Is it creating in me a loving attitude towards someone else? Lovely doesn't mean is it pretty. <laughs> but is it creating, is it cultivating the love of God, that thought, that thought? Is it cultivating the love of God? If it's not, I, I ought to get rid of that thing. Is it a good report versus a negative report? Is it, is it a virtue? Meaning the quality of it is kind of sound. It is good. It is something to my edification. If there be any praise. Oh, I like this. Can I take that thought and praise God with it? Now, that's going back to Hebrews 4, 12. You remember where it says he is a discerner of the thoughts and the intents. So now we're back to submitting my mind to the Lord. How can I praise God with that thought in my mind? You know, I would venture to say that there's times when, you know, we've, we might have even showed up to church with a negative thought in our mind and we can't, we can't praise God, can we? Something went, something happened that morning and things are crazy. And it's just, it's just, boy, we're just trying to do everything we can to work it through the, through the service because that negative thought is just loading us down. It's loading us down. And I cannot praise God because my thoughts are not worthy. You see that, that that's not, that's an unworthy thought. And, and let me dig just a little bit deeper. See, at the moment that I recognize that, I ought to say, God, you're worthy, and I'm going to get rid of that, and I'm going to praise you anyhow. 
it'd be gone. I don't have to, I don't have to forfeit my time in the presence of God and in the presence of saints because I didn't take care of this beforehand. But if it comes up and I find I'm not worshiping God, I can take care of it now. I've done it so many, so many times, more than I can tell you at the stand here and say, Lord God, I, I, you're still worthy. You are worthy. I'm not worthy. You are worthy. Anyone who would be thinking the way I'm thinking, that's, Lord, I'm not worthy. And you take care of business. Lord, forgive me. That's just rotten. It's, it's not there. Now, you're going to have to do something between there and getting up here. Take care of it. Don't try to be a superman or a superwoman. These things happen to us. It's what we do with it that matters. It's what we do with it that matters. And then lastly, he says, think on these things. Discipline yourself in these things. Discipline yourself in these things. Initially, it's going to seem strange. Initially, it may even seem I'm being really hypocritical because I ain't feeling this. Don't care how you feel. Keep doing it. When you start off running, you don't feel like 15 miles either. You don't feel like one mile. <laughs> Amen? And everything in your body is telling you, fool, go, go home and, and, and sit down. But if you keep doing it, those negative thoughts about the seventh and the eighth mile start to come up again. But because you have learned to deal with those thoughts, you make it all the way through. That's the difference. The thoughts didn't stop coming. The pain didn't stop coming. None of that stopped. What stopped? My mental state. That's what changed. Okay. And, and it changed because I've disciplined myself to do that. Just jot this one down. Understand we have the power to renew our mind. For who has known the mind of the Lord? Now this is good. That we may instruct him, but we have the mind of Christ. What does that mean? What is the mind of Christ? Scripture says Christ learned obedience. How? Through the things in which he suffered. That's the mind of Christ. What is the mind of Christ? What I see my Father do, that's what I do also. I do nothing of my own. What is the mind of Christ? If you abide in me and I abide in you, you shall ask what you will. What is the mind of Christ? I have completed the work that you have given me. I have glorified your name. The mind of Christ is not some mystical thing we have. But it is saying that if the Holy Spirit is in us and Christ is in us, we don't have a mindless spirit in us. We have the mind of Christ. We know somewhat how he thinks. Because the spirit testifies of him. He says he wouldn't testify of himself. The Holy Spirit said that. So, so if I have the mind of Christ, I'm already feeling pretty good that, wait a minute, I know what I should do because... The Holy Spirit is bringing to my remembrance those things, which is the mind of Christ. He's obeying. He's obedient. He is desirous of the things of the Lord. And then, of course, the fifth one might be Romans 12, 1 and 2. 
I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God. Romans 12, 1 and 2. I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God. When he talks about that I would submit that, that we should um, present our bodies, that includes our mind. We should present our mind. Open our mind. Be attentive. Lydia was attentive to what Paul and them were saying. She was, she was attentive to the word of God. And therefore she could receive. We need to be attentive to what God is, 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 is speaking to us. But it says, present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is a reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world. But be ye transformed, how? By the renewing of your mind. We all know this. That you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Prove means to discern. Prove is not uh, a trial and error that we go through to figure out what's right and what's wrong. It's not trial and error. It's assurance. Amen? Amen? Present ourselves to the word of God. Give ourselves to the very word of God. Because to transform has nothing to do with the outward man. Conform has something to do with the outward man, doesn't it? Transform means my inner man. And who's the inner man? My thoughts. As a man thinketh, so is he. My thoughts. And so he's saying, change your inner thoughts. Your inner thoughts. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you can discern, you can discern what is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. It doesn't say, Go ahead out there and try this and then try that. And if that don't work, try this. And one of these is going to work. And so then you're going to know. We already know. Now we're back to meditating. You see, this is, this is a discipline that has to take place. You cannot take any one of the scriptures I gave you today and make this work. We have to take it all, all of it. All of it, because it, it speaks to me transforming my mind. So I have to have something there, right? If I'm going to now discern what is that good and uh, perfect will of God, acceptable, uh, that good and acceptable and perfect will of God, how am I going to discern that? Through trial and error? I do this and it works. So that must mean God is in it? No, he may not be in it. Just because it works doesn't mean he's in it. Does it achieve God's goal? Now, that's another question I should ask. If it, if it works and achieves God's goal, he's in it. But he's not calling us to do trial and error. Kind of fumble around. You keep trying. You'll get it sooner or later. He's saying you can know it, but you got to do it. You got to do it. You got to pack this in the mind and... And do it because after all, it is your reasonable service. Number six, Colossians chapter three, verse 13. Our favorite subject, our favorite subject that we don't like to talk about. Colossians chapter three, verse 13 says, Forbearing one another and, what's the next word? Forgiving one another. If any man have a quarrel against any, and the last part of that is what? Even as Christ forgave you, so also you. Uh, forbearing is enduring. And the forbearing, which he says first here, 
is relating to something that's happening right now. It's in the present. Something is pressing on us right now in the presence, and we have to endure that thing. Uh, to put it in just some common language, it's kind of putting up with folks, putting up with some things that we cannot control. I cannot control anybody as much as we might want to, even for their good, even for their good. How many of us have done some just wonderful, long-term, good things for folks and they didn't get any better? They, they're, 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 they're the same as they, they always were. Amen? Uh, sometimes people do not act the way we expect them to act. Now, what do I mean by this? Not that we're expecting them to be super spiritual. And so they're out of line with that. But as we have invented in our mind the response that we want. And if that response is not manifested, Katie bar the door. Now, we all do that sometimes. And we're trying to figure out, why are you not responding? You're supposed to respond this way. Now, the person sitting next to you, in front of you, or standing in front of you, they don't know what you're thinking. How are they ever going to respond to that, right? And so, as I've said this before, as we demand, not verbally, but internally, we demand people kind of overlook our faults. Don't get all over me. That's just my weaknesses. Well, we should also return the favor. Do not think that because nobody has told you about the thing you're doing to them that, that irritates them, they, just because they didn't tell you don't mean it ain't there. It means they're enduring. They're taking the bullet. And sometimes when we get so into ourselves, forbearance is the last thing we want to hear. Because I've got, I'm going to have my way. I'm going to have my way. And we don't get our way. And what happens to the thought pattern? It gets negative. And now I'm thinking all kinds of garbage is just, we hadn't just opened the door. We took the roof off. said, <laughs> pour it in here. And if we don't stop and check that at some point, uh, then it, it becomes a stronghold. And it carries off and it spills off into, uh, it, it can be, you know, I'm walking in Kmart and somebody accidentally bumps into me and I go into a rage. You don't like me. Yeah, I, I know about your kind and all that. I mean, it just goes on. And because, why? Because we have invented something. We've allowed it to blow up. And it's affecting other areas of our life that we wouldn't even connect to this incident. That's, the, that's just the nature of sin, folks. That's just how sin works. It'll sneak in, and it'll sneak in an area that, that for us may not seem that bad. All it wants to do is get in. It'll tear up the house. And you'd be trying to figure out what happened. Why? But I, I, thought, I didn't think that was that bad. And so it snuck into that little crack. But once it got in, all it wants to do is get in. Because once it gets there... <laughs> It's going gonna, it's gonna to raise havoc. Forbearing speaks of the moment. Forgiving speaks to past actions. Something has happened, and I'm allowing that to accumulate resentment 
and anger in, in me. And <laughs> the only solution to that is forgiveness. And I don't, I don't want to keep beating a dead horse, but that is, that's probably the second hardest thing for us to do. Because if we're right, we stand on our being right. The problem is that's not good enough. Being right ought to be good enough. Because my goal in life, what? Is to please God. Without faith, no man shall see God. Without faith, we can't, we can't please God. And so my whole purpose in life is to please God. Amen? And if I'm pleasing God... I have to be forgiven, have a forgiving spirit, and I have to be predisposed to give. If I've been offended, it hurts. And that hurt can develop a stronghold that will raise havoc with other parts of the life, life, sleepless nights, uh, fear, uh, just uneasy feeling. All sorts of things can go on because of an unforgiving spirit. Now, I know that's difficult, but we can get there. You see, when we talk about being predisposed to forgive, we have to remember that God has declared that Jesus was the lamb that was slain before the foundation of the world was. He was already predisposed to forgive before he created anything. And when we're walking with the Lord... We should be predisposed to forgive. And forgiveness is a God thing. What did forgiveness do for God? Not what He did for us. Why did God have to, in His grace, why did He forgive us? Well, so we could be saved. Oh, no. He forgave us to satisfy himself. That his wrath would be removed from us and making us then acceptable to him through Jesus Christ. It hurts to forgive because I, inside of me I have a right not to. The sin is too egregious for me to simply forgive because if I forgive, I let them off the hook. God let us off the hook. And he did that the day we got saved. And he let us off the hook the next day, and the next day, and the next day. And every time that we confess our sins, and he, he promises to forgive us, he's letting us off the hook. Simply because, the, Jesus gives one example, simply because we ask him to forgive us. Not that we deserve to be forgiven. And so forbearing is enduring, forgiving is just that. I am not in my spirit, in my soul, in my mind, in my actions going to hold this against the one who offended me. 
That is no more than a decision we make. Where? Right here. Everything on this side is saying to me, but, but, but. And every but is cultivating the flesh. That's what it's doing. It's riling up the flesh against, and we just read, casting down every imagination and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. So the old man is just, boy, but, but, yeah, you're right, but, but, ain't nobody listening, but, but. And the only solution is forgiveness. There is no other one. I think part of what Jesus was asking the Father when he said, if there be any other way, had to do with forgiveness. Sin had to be dealt with, sin had to be forgiven, and sin had to be paid for. I'm not going to tell you when you forgive that the pain goes away. But in time, it will. You see, the Lord rejoices when he sees us now. But at one time, it pained him just to look at us. But when he forgave us, it says that all of heaven rejoiced. <laughs> Amen. All of heaven rejoiced. Because forgiveness means reconciliation is what it means. And God wants us. So we have to follow that pattern. I've just got two more points and, we'll, and I'll be done. And so we need to do that even as Christ has forgiven us. Amen. Romans 15.1, just write it down. We then that are strong are to bear the infirmities of the weak and not to please our own self. Philippians 2, 4, let every man on his, let every man on his, uh, let every man on his own things, think on his own, not to think on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. We can get to be self-centered in a hurry, can't we? The world does not rotate around us. We have to come to that point where we recognize that it's not about me. It's about me and my relationship with God. And that everything that is buzzing around me and everything that's happening around me is, is, is because God is working something in his plan out. Who, who He wants to include me into that plan. And the things that he's working out is to, to bring me into alignment with what he is doing. Not just in my life, but in his redemptive plan. He's done everything he's going to do in, in our lives. and He done saved us. Amen. And so what he's doing now is making us more fit to be his disciples. To give us that assurance of our salvation. I'm glad God didn't take us to heaven the day that we said, I'm saved. Because we might not have been saved. Think about that. There has to be some proving ground. We haven't talked about that a lot, and maybe I should develop that and, and talk to us about it. There has to be a proving ground so that we are assured. We are assured. We don't fool God, but we can fool ourselves and end up up there and not stay there. Matthew 7, uh, um, 21, I believe it is, says that many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord. In other words, many are going to profess to have known the Lord. And, and, and then what's, what's, what's neat about that, the Lord says, here's what you say, but now I get the last word. And it actually says in there, but I say, I never knew you. So these aren't people who were once saved and got lost. These are people who were lost and yet were proclaiming to be saved. There has to be this, this period of time that you and I need to, to affirm, that's why I, I, I came to the message this morning, kind of towards the end of this salvation stuff, that there has to be a period of time of testing, and that testing is for us, for us to have the assurance, not God, but for us. 
so that no one g- goes to heaven and, and they're surprised. Well, I thought I said the right thing. No, it's not what you said. It's not what you did. It's what you believe. Amen. And then I would just, uh, in closing on this, this question, I would say, look at Psalms 37. We went over that already. Uh, every morning, spend some time just reading that psalm. And when you read the psalm, I want you to kind of underline the action, the action verbs. The actions, the things that it's telling you to do and the things that it's specifically telling you not to do. For example, and I'll just read a few of them. The first verse says, fret not thyself against evildoers. Well, that's good to read in the morning because you're going to work. (laughs) And there's a bunch of evildoers there. Amen. Verse 3, trust in the Lord and do good. Verse 4, delight thyself in the Lord. 5, commit thy way unto the Lord. 7, rest in the Lord. 8, cease to do, uh, cease from, from anger. 18, the Lord knows the days of the upright and their inheritance shall be forever. 23, the steps of a good man are ordered by, by the Lord. Verse 31, the law, the law of his God is in his heart and none of his steps shall, shall slide. 34, wait on the Lord and keep his way. 37, mark the protected man. Follow good example. It's right there. Boy, isn't that great in one place? And so if I'm, I'm trying to renew my mind, um, you know, what came first, the chicken or the egg? That's an easy question. The chicken did. Because God had created it. There's some things that must come first. This renewing of your mind has to be right at the top of the list. For without it, everything else is academic. But once we start to do that, let me just tell you something. The years of study will just start to line up. All that information that we got, boy, will just start to come into focus at one, at one time. Isn't that great? So we haven't lost a lot, but if we'll go ahead and and now put this at the top of the list and say, you know, Lord, I know now how uh, to renew my mind. I know the importance of renewing my mind. I've given my mind to some things. That's why I'm out of control. I'm taking back control. Okay, I'm taking back control of my thoughts. I'm taking back control of what I put into my head and, and what I don't put into my head. Amen? Any follow-ups on that before we, uh, before we wrap up? Let's pray.